Okay, everybody. So the warmest of welcomes to tonight's Labour Women's Network In Conversation event, uh, which we have titled Millennial Misogyny, uh, Tackling Tate. Now, we know that misogyny has existed in many, many forms throughout the ages and that for as long as there have been men and women through evolution, there has been woman hate. Uh, and women have had to develop strategies to stay resilient in the face of that. And women activists over the ages have had to come up with ways to uh, diffuse the abuse from our um, misogynist opponents and to uh, find ways of uh, surviving as it takes new forms. But of course, this is 2023. And so we now have misogyny 2.0, the digital age. And we've seen some ugly iterations of that already uh, but I think one of the ugliest has emerged over the past few years in the form of influencers like Andrew Tate uh, and a few similar individuals who seem to target children in particular they target boys, they target young men, they're very clever with the algorithms so it starts off very uh, kind of fluffy and um, seemingly harmless, maybe a click on something about cars, maybe something about sports and three or four clicks later children are being exposed to both language and ideology that some of us find deeply concerning and that we know is linked to an increase in sexual harassment in our schools and colleges and universities. Um, and in abuse of women um, in both public and private. Uh, the actual specific moment I decided Labour Women's Network probably ought to run an event on uh, these themes was uh, on the bus on a way ba back from a trip to the toy shop with my nine-year-old son. Uh, he told me and he did wait until we were on the bus home before he revealed it because he knew I might kick off and spoil the toy the Lego shopping otherwise but that when he'd been to the boys toilets in the toy shop there had been a big sticker about Andrew Tate on the back of the toilet door and he knew that was something that made him feel uncomfortable. Uh, and he couldn't understand why those ideas were in that happy space, basically. And I've had that conversation with another parent who said they found a leaflet on the back of a toilet door in a soft play centre. These are places where children should be able to be children. And I know that across the country, parents, carers, teachers, uh, anyone with a sense of duty of care towards uh, the next generation or just a passion for um, Britain to uphold the highest standards of safety, inclusion and equality have been having these difficult conversations um, with young people who have come under Tate's influence and that of other similar people. So we wanted to bring together tonight two of my absolute favourite sisters in the Labour movement, the fantastic Alex Davis Jones, um, who is one of my favourite MPs, one of my favourite Welsh feminist MPs, uh, who joins us tonight uh, from Westminster and not from the Welsh Valleys, but nonetheless is Welsh Valleys to her bones. She is Labour's shadow uh, Minister for Digital Gambling and Tech, uh, so brings with her both a policy hat and I know a lot of personal passion on these issues. And obviously recently Alex challenged the Prime Minister about this in PMQs and then subsequently shared that she had been uh, subject to rape and death threats on the back of her bravery in doing so. So I think perhaps we can explore some of those um factors tonight as well, the abuse of women in public life as they seek to challenge uh, these cultures and these issues. Um, and Shyster will be interviewed by our fabulous guest interviewer, Shyster Aziz, who uh, is one of the most impressive women I've ever had the pleasure to work with. She is a broadcast and print journalist and international development um, expert, 
uh, and founder of the Three Hijabis Campaign Against Racism in Sport, alongside two other brilliant women. Uh, and importantly, from a Labour Women's Network context, a graduate of cohort four of the Joe Cox Women in Leadership Scheme. Uh, and I am delighted to uh, bring these two brilliant women together tonight, and I can't wait to hear the conversation ensue. Uh, we're going to allow them to talk for a while, and then we're going to open up to your questions. So if you've got any burning questions, feel free to pop them in the comments, and we will make sure that they've seen those later on, or there'll be an opportunity for you to um, ask questions questions yourself. So I hope you've all got a cup of tea or a glass of water and that you're in a comfortable space. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Shaisto. Thank you so much, Claire, and everybody involved in organising this discussion uh, this evening. And I'll just start, first of all, by saying happy International Women's Month stroke year, stroke decade. As far as I'm concerned, we should be celebrating the sisterhood every day of the week, not just uh, once a year, but you know, we should have an official day in the calendar as well. So I'm not knocking that. So yeah, so thank you very much for organizing uh, the discussion. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, a sister's already put something in the chat about just making sure we all keep our microphones muted so we don't get feedback. But we definitely do want to hear from all of you and you all will have a chance to speak. So um, without further ado, Alex, it's lovely to be in your company as well. And I'm just going to start just by asking you, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Shaista. Yeah, I'm OK. Um, I'm in Westminster and Noswaitha, everybody, good evening. Um, I'm in Westminster, as you uh, said, Claire. Um, we're preparing to vote against the horrendous and abhorrent anti-illegal immigration bill this evening. So expecting a late night sitting. And then after that, we've got the extension motion, which I'll be responding to for the opposition on the online safety bill. So um, quite relevant to what we're going to be discussing tonight. And yeah, uh, just challenging the government on their failure to tackle uh, harmful content online and the delays that inevitable and unnecessary delays we've had to this legislation for far too long so that's that's yeah. right but no I'm okay I'm good good well thanks Alex for all the work that you do and thanks in particular for what you know being around this evening and uh getting yourself organized and ready to vote as well so let's start um by kind of looking at the parallels between you, you and me. We're both women in politics, obviously at different level of politics. You're in Westminster and I'm a local councillor. And we've both suffered, stroke, struggled, been challenged with misogyny online as women in politics. And there'd be many sisters here who are on the same boat as us as well. So I'm just wondering, have you, are you noticing a change in how misogyny is manifesting? um from like when you were you know at school to you know going through education uh through to now being being a, a well-known mp and in politics yeah. I, I i definitely think it's um easier and um, more accessible to be a misogynist now than it probably was and it's more um actually openly accepted as well if you look at what's happening online in terms of the abuse that women suffer women of color even more so in terms of their voices being shouted down or their opinions being drowned out or just you know pylons of uh, abuse that they get for speaking speaking their truth to power or speaking their mind or just even existing in that space and it's horrendous and um i was quite actually lucky i suppose if that's the word that i hadn't had really much abuse online until it was the online safety bill and I started speaking out about um, the disinformation, the horrendous racism that was being spouted by the likes of Tommy Robinson and Patriotic Alternative and um, that was sort of on the lesser well-known social media platforms that the online safety bill doesn't really cover and um, it leaves a loophole there for this horrendous content to continue to perpetuate without any real regulation so it was wasn't until I started talking about that where it got clipped and then shared on these underground platforms more widely within their circles and that's when the abuse started and it was on social media email uh you know mail to my constituency and Westminster office um yeah and all the stuff you can really imagine and um, when that was coming through in its various different forms were you were you seeing how organized it was was it kind of quite obvious to you and your your team yeah. that you know this was coming from a particular organized um groups or 
How, how did that connect? Yes, it was. So and the, the police and Hope Not Hate and CST, who are the organisations who monitor abuse that sort of we get as politicians and, and women, particularly in public life online, they were noticing a pattern and they would be alerted whenever I was going to speak in the House of Commons or whenever I was particularly going to raise the issue of, of you know, anti-Semitism or misogyny um, online or, or calling out some of these organizations and individuals who were perpetuating this harmful content, then it would be it would be organized activity by them. They would clip what where I was speaking, share it on these platforms, and then um, use that as an orchestrated attack or so pile on. They would say to email me directly or to comment on Instagram or uh, attack me on Twitter. And they they would troll back through posts going back years on Instagram, for example, and comment whatever they could on my posts. But it was definitely organised. But it was it was easy to spot. And what kind of support did you get, Alex? What, what kind of things were put in place to help you? And did you feel that you were getting the support you needed? Yes, definitely. So so I will say the police have been excellent and they've jumped on this, um, particularly following the sort of speaking out about the misogyny regarding Andrew Tate. Um, they've been brilliant and they're pursuing a number of uh, investigations following some of the really, really horrendous uh, communications that I've had. Um, colleagues have been brilliant. So the sisterhood in Parliament is strong across all parties, I will say. It hasn't just been Labour in terms of reaching out. Men have been brilliant. My male colleagues have been great in showing solidarity. Um, and the community as well. So it hasn't all been abuse in speaking out. I've received some fantastic support from women and men who've written to me to thank me. Um, I've had cards, I've had flowers. It's been, yeah, it's be definitely been a mixed bag and it just spurs me on to do more. Yeah, and I think it's really important what you pointed out there because without trying to discount in any shape, way or form the level of abuse and also the fact that some of these, some of this abuse is coming from very organised uh, extremist groups. So, you know, we have to be very um, clear here that, you know, the risk to your safety and well-being, and indeed your loved ones as well does increase. Um, but then the flip side also is that there is this other a response isn't there there's there's a loud uh compassionate caring response for people who know right from wrong and who decide not to be silent and i think it's important to emphasize that as well isn't it yeah it is it's it's brilliant it's been brilliant and the only reason you know the reason why i stood up and asked that question and at prime minister's questions was because of all the work i've done on the online safety bill so i've been seeing firsthand some of the some of the issues around you know the algorithms and business models that monetize misery and share this level of content um, and amplify it because because it benefits them, not because you know because of any other reason, just purely for a monetized value. Um, but also because when I when I'm in schools and doing school visits, or when I'm meeting with young people or parents in my constituency, they are absolutely sick to the back teeth of having to deal with this day in day out without any support and um, nobody realizing what they're having to go through. Um, and it's not just you know this certain type of content you know I, I don't want to keep mentioning him but you know Andrew Tate is the figurehead but there's many more like him um that type of content that is being pushed online to young boys but also young girls um it's not just that there's also all the other issues of of online safety that that schools are having to deal with you know whether that's cyber bullying whether it's um, intimate image abuse um self-generated child pornography with sharing intimate images of each other to you know um or um, filming each other or, you know, these awful challenges that are appearing on social media that are really dangerous. So every single day, teachers are having to deal with something that is happening on social media that is um, then creating an offline issue and it's seeping into the classroom. It's preventing children from learning. It's giving them, you know, mental health issues. It's giving them, um, it's, you know, creating a lack of focus and it's stopping teachers doing what they need to do, which is teach. So that was why it had to be raised and it, it just can't, it can't be allowed to continue. Totally agree with you, Alex. And also it goes beyond young people, doesn't it? And children, minors, it goes right into adulthood, as we've seen with the Me Too movement, um, when it started the second time around and the level of pushback. And, you know, this thing about, oh, you know, can men no longer pat a woman on the knee? Is that what this movement is about? Uh, you know, that kind of framing. So it's not just young people, is it? In a society um, that overwhelmingly does see itself as liberal uh, compared to many other parts of the world, I guess we are. But the issue of consent, I mean, when I was growing up, um, when I at school through university, consent wasn't something anybody sat me down and talked to me about. Um, I wasn't ever given any really clear 
guidelines or framework around consent. Um, you know, my understanding of um, me having a right to decide, you know, who, who gets to access me and my body and all of that really came through my uh, feminist education. And it came through education um, at home and through friends and things like that. It didn't come formally um, yes. from school or from anybody else in society. And that's part of, I think that's part of the big challenge here, isn't it? It is. It's part of the problem. And, and I can't, I cannot see how um, the government and society, um, you know, will essentially prioritise men's right to have banter over women's rights not to be harassed, which is what they're doing in terms of some of the new offences that have been created in the online safety bill, but also in terms of the um, intimate image abuse. So revenge porn, which we, we don't call it that anymore, but that's what it's known as you know, this horrendous behaviour, but it's all intent-based rather than consent-based. And intent is almost impossible to prove. Um, and that's what they've done with cyber flashing. So they've made it in the new, in the bill, they've made this new offence intent-based rather than consent-based. So men will have, and it's always predominantly men, as we know, they will have a right to say that, oh, you know, I didn't intend to cause harm. It wasn't my intention to cause distress. I was just you know, having banter, I thought she would enjoy it. I thought she would like it. And because of that, we are we are literally prioritizing men's right to have this banter or this excuse over women's right to feel harassed. And it's it's not acceptable. And if we're to have this wider culture change, then it has to be a consent based approach. It has to be it's black and white. You either want to receive it or you don't. There, there should be no gray area. Absolutely. Now, as you said, we don't want to mention his name repeatedly. We know um, his name is uh, very much in the title of our conversation this evening, and we're going to get specifically onto him. But as we know, he's a figurehead, but he's one of many. Um, yes. What I wanted to ask you is when you uh, when you go about doing your work and you're in schools and places, you know, workplaces or education settings and you're hearing from those who've been victimized in this way what kind of what kind of things are coming up and also what kind of support what kind of um you know what, what kind of help is available to people who are suffering in this way well look, let's be clear like we've said there is this one person who's sort of spearheading this uh current reform of of online misogyny but We've had misogynists, as Claire said, around and sexists around since day dot. You know, it, it's not something new, really. But the issue here is how it's being amplified. And, you know, I am a I'm a defender of free speech. You know, um, I, I have. And, and, you know, Andrew Tate is entitled to his views, however abhorrent that I may think they are. He is entitled to have them if they are legal. Sadly, I think they're awful but he's entitled to have them. The problem is when those views are amplified um, through an algorithm which monetizes misery and pushes even more and more extreme content onto you when you didn't ask for it. So if you walk into a bookshop and you ask for a self-help guide um, from the bookkeeper, the bookkeeper isn't going to constantly bombard you with suggestions on even more extremist content and even more extremist books. And then after you've left that shop, send you emails or notifications constantly about what type of content you can see to join a group about self-help, to, to um, increase your awareness, to join this network, to, to view this video. But that's what's happening online. And that's what's happening to young people and adults and everybody is they are being shown this. It's not a town square situation anymore. It's that um, actively pushing of these business models and, and algorithms that are sending you more and more extremist content. And I've met with the social media platforms and all of them I have spoken to have, have explained to me that the content that is being put out by this misogynist would not meet the threshold for takedown. You know, what he's saying is, is does not meet their sort of uh, terms and conditions of takedown. He's actually been deplatformed for his offline activity. So that's why he's been taken down. But as I've said, it's the, it's the business models that push you into more extreme videos, more extreme content. And once they've got you, they've got you and you're part of that network. And it's, it's really difficult to escape. And teachers in the classroom are telling me that boys in primary schools are coming out with, you know, comments such as... Um, Women belong, you know, the old tropes that we all hear. Women shouldn't be in work. They should be at home, you know. You should be a stay-at-home mother. Um, women belong in the kitchen and men go out to work. So the base, you know, the sexist sort of tropes that, that have been around since day dot to the more extreme content, like I don't want to be taught by a female teacher. You can't tell me what to do because you're part of the problem. The school is run by women and women are only here to serve men. So, uh, and then also the really sort of, dangerous rhetoric which is around sexual violence and um the the really horrendous stuff that's being sort of 
talk to girls and how and that how they are being treated um, and that's the problem and schools haven't got nowhere to turn they're given sort of tools on how to deal with racism they've got we've got this when they teach you know literature in schools they're given well, if you teach to kill a mockingbird you're, you're taught how to deal with that in the classroom you're not sort of given those tools to deal with misogyny and sexism in the same way you're, you're given the resources in order to deal with homophobia but you're not sort of um, given the uh, the tools to deal with misogyny and sexism, and it's it's having it's leading leaving that space for charities to have to step in to fill this gap. And women's, I you know I've spoken to women's aid, and they're doing great stuff in terms of sort of arming teachers and arming uh, trusted professionals with with some of the you know the information to counteract this. Uh, hope not hate are stepping in and are delivering a schools program in order to help, but it shouldn't be left for charities to try and pick up the pieces here this needs to be this needs to have leadership it needs to this needs to be led from the top and I've met with you know the education minister in Wales I've spoken to the education minister in England um and something needs to be done and, and we're changing the curriculum in Wales you know it, it's 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 re- doing some really groundbreaking things and that comes with its own challenges because you've got the the scaremongering as we saw last week in prime minister's questions around that as well and it's about challenging that narrative but one of the things that the female teachers have told me has been really telling is the reaction to the, their male colleagues. So some of them have been fantastic allies and have been helping. And it's and it's those sort of uh, male role models that the boys are responding to when they're counteracting this. But some of them have been silent and some of them are failing to sort of step in and interact with this, which is which has been really difficult for them. So I think that's that's where one of the issues lies here is because. No, I I never was a teenage boy. I can't I can't discuss on on what it must be like growing up. But I've had them. You know, I've I've got two teenage stepsons, and I you know, and it's it's difficult. You're going through a lot, and it's it's how do you navigate that um, change in yourself and the need for positive masculinity and the need for a positive male role model when you've got this this guy who is everywhere. He is filling every social media platform. All your friends are talking about him. He exhibits this um, attainable lifestyle, which is completely fake, but is everything you would want in terms of success. He talks about, um, you know, he talks about male empowerment. He he uses the buzzwords to suck you in. And in where there's an absence, although there's not, but an absence of male role models in that field, then of course he's sucking in that audience and it's and it's really dangerous. But like Claire mentioned young boys, it's also young women. So there's young girls in school who are saying that that's the lifestyle they want. They want to be, a, you know, a, a stay-at-home girlfriend and have an allowance from their male partner and look after them. And because that's what they're being told is their role in life. And it's it's really, really dangerous. And it's, it's yeah, and I'm so yeah. fearful. And it's how, how do we tackle it? What's the answer? Yeah, thanks for that very um, important overview, as depressing as it is. And I'm glad you focused on the women and girls, because as we know, patriarchy is, you know, it it, it impacts men. If if patriarchy is designed to dehumanise women and girls, then by default, it also dehumanises boys and men. Um, And this is the message that we need to get across to everyone in society that, you know, patriarchy is, it destroys everybody in the end, right? Um, And like you, Alex, I've spent time in schools uh, listening to girls. And I remember a couple of years ago, I went into school in London um, to do some training around consent uh, with another organization, freelancing with, and I was quite, at first I was quite horrified. And then I had to kind of put myself in check because I thought, well, you know, there's no point in me being horrified. I'm here to listen and then to try and assist the teacher and assist others in the school to move things forward. But a, a couple of young girls started talking to me about uh, when they, and then their words, get touched up on the way to school. So I said, well, where does this happen? And they said, everywhere, miss. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, on the bus, on the tube, walking on the road, walking on the on the path. And I said, so they looked at my face and my face had just fallen. And they went, what's wrong, miss? It's normal. And I was like, whoa. So I said, there is absolutely nothing normal about any of this. And I really would like you to understand this. And they seemed really shocked. It was like one of the first times 
a grown adult had told them this is not normal yeah. so um, they were really intrigued by this so they were like well, can you tell us more so I was like yeah I can so I explained to them that they were you know this is not normal um you know no one has the right to touch your body to talk to you in this way and even if you think you want them to do that I would really ask you to question that is especially when you're in your school uniform so they were a bit you know they were a bit um taken aback by this and also if you remember going into a school in east london um the day of the 2018 election no less so i was in london and then i went back um to do some canvassing elsewhere um but very quickly conversations about um respecting each other's rights got onto pornography very quickly within about 10 minutes and I found it interesting that these young boys wanted to talk to me a woman a visible Muslim woman at first they were a bit like oh you know not really sure if you can talk to her about these things and then it was like boom they just got straight into it and they all got into they got into pornography and they were telling me about porn and you know my friend does this I was like is it your friend or is it you anyway in the end one of them said oh am I allowed to have pornography on my phone and I said no because you're 12 years old and he was like oh so we got into this conversation about how how you can get into trouble for sharing images even if you didn't have have those images you didn't create them yourself but it was very very quick it went from naught to 500 within 10 minutes and it was about pornography and as we know recently a study's come out to um, look at the level of pornography and the type of pornography that young people are consuming and there is a connection isn't there between between pornography, rape culture, uh, let's name him Andrew Tate, yeah. um, and the kind of um, the big man lifestyle that he's created with the Ferraris, big love to Greta for uh, tackling yeah. that. Um, but, you know, on a serious note, I mean, the, all these things are connected, aren't they? They are, and you, you raise a really important point, which I read uh, this week about how we're being sort of indoctrinated and desensitized to what's happening. You know, we've got the girls in, that you you were speaking to just, isn't that normal, miss? To, I read a really interesting article over the weekend by Marie Leconte, um, who's a journalist, and she was talking about how um, she was speaking to her female group of friends and how normalized choking has become during sex and nobody calls it out. It's just seen as a now standard practice during sex and I'm not here to kink shame anyone you know but it's it's how normalized violent behavior is and she was saying that her girlfriends you know they didn't like it but they didn't really not like it either but is that what it's become now where we're having to put up with something that we don't you know it's that we will tolerate because it's seen as normal practice and it's so that could end up killing you or injuring exactly, you and again exactly. we're not here to yeah. kink shame anyone no. in a consensual adult relationship you should be able to negotiate what you want to do when you want to do it that, that's what we're here to, to discuss when- yeah but it's when it's completely normalized and, and it's not even something that you want to do. It's just something that you feel you have to put up with because it's seen as what is conventional now. And, and when did that happen? And as you said, it's it's extreme pornography becoming the norm and young children viewing this really harmful content, thinking that that's what a normal, healthy, consensual relationship is. And it's it's really dangerous and devastating. It really yes, is. It um, Alex, we're sort of coming towards the end of our conversation because we want to bring in the audience. But before we do that, I really want to focus on this issue of intersectionality. So you spoke about it at the beginning when you talked about, you know, the kind of things you've been doing um, at Westminster and beyond. Um, but let, let's mention him again, Andrew Tate. So recently, Andrew Tate went on record to say that he converted to Islam. Um, deep breath. And there was a lot of controversy around that. Um, So uh, there is lots and lots of stereotypes about all women everywhere, but with Muslim women in particular, we're subservient, um, you know, we're very, um, we're very fixed on our particular oppression, oppressive roles, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a desexualization of Muslim women as well, particularly those of us who choose to wear the headscarf. We're either, we're, we're hyper visible and we're hyper invisible. So our sexu- sexuality, um, and our womanhood is often denied because we're, you know, we're accused of wanting to cover up and, you know, be, we're ashamed of ourselves. And that's why we choose to dress this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Funnily enough, a lot of these narratives, most of them are constructed by men who knew. But anyway, so, you know, th- these dynamics as well are so, so dangerous, particularly when we've got rising Islamophobia. We've got rising racism. And uh, when it particularly comes to Muslim men, we very rarely see any you know, regular depictions of Muslim men. We just see the terrorist 
or we see the agitator, or we see violence. We don't see the 360 degrees of you know imagery of Muslim men, but it's not just men. I think this also applies to Muslim men. It also applies to all men. We don't see um, society is not providing these images to them as much as it's um, sh showing harmful images to women as well. So I just wanted to touch on this issue of intersectionality. So the invisibility of women with disabilities, the hyper visual visibility of black women who are deemed to be oversexed and up for it more than other women, as we know. Um, you know, all these all these intersections of misogyny. Um, which really make the whole experience of this so much more horrifying, quite frankly, if you have these additional identities. And I also want to touch on transphobia. Again, deep breath, because what I'm finding in my work is there is a link between this whole conception that, you know, in the West, nobody knows if they can be a man anymore or if they can be a woman anymore and blah, 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 blah. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think far too often as women and as sisters, and particularly feminists, we are so stuck in our little silos and we're kind of fighting for, um, you know, uh, we're fighting the good fight on all fronts, but what we're not understanding is how all of this comes together and how if we don't start understanding this better, intersectionality and bringing it to all our work and our campaigning work and our politics, and if we don't start treating each other as sisters, um, we've got no chance. Yeah, so absolutely. that's a bit of a question and a very long statement there, Alex, so you have to forgive me for that, but oh. I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. No, you're right. You're right. You know, all of these things intersect and it's about who are we fighting you? Where's our fight? It's the, you know, you mentioned it's the patriarchy. It's those who who seek to shut us down, who um, try to pin hatred and division amongst us, which is what which is what all of these people are trying to do in terms of of their narrative and stalking division, stalking hatred, trying to push blame onto someone else and to create that um that position of power and influence and yeah you mentioned you know Andrew Tate sort of um infiltrating the Muslim community putting himself on this pedestal as a purveyor of of Islam now and, and a defender of of Muslim rights and and I've had uh you know my local Muslim community reach out to me and say he does not speak for us you know this man is not someone who who is a defender of, of what we stand for he's not speaking for us but then I have had also Muslim men contact me and email me and saying you know this man is stand he's he's a western ally he is a white man who is standing up for Muslim values and and he is somebody who we've been crying out for all this time and it's it's really difficult and as I and as I said, you know, you need that sort of, you need to counteract that positive masculinity out there. We need those other allies to be out there and to stand up and to sort of take some of this, you know, why should it be on all of our shoulders? We need, we need our brothers and sisters to sort of join arms with us in terms of, of fighting back the good fight um, because it can't be all to us. And it is, you know, we know it's primarily um, those those women who are of another um, sort of protected characteristic, whether it's whether they're disabled, whether they're a woman of colour, whether they are a, a woman who's a member of the LGBTQ plus community who are going to be more easily targeted, more easily um, shouted down and have their freedom of speech silenced online. You know, I, I said I'm a purveyor of freedom of speech that comes for everybody's freedom of speech. Um, and it can't be that women and uh, minority women are pushed out of these spaces because it's easy to shout them down. Um, and it's a difficult fight to fight. But yeah, we're in it. We're in it. Yeah. Well said, Alex. And just for the just for the record, because this has been recorded, obviously we appreciate and understand that there isn't just one faith group that you know has been particularly hijacked by these extremists. Uh, there's you know there's there's a band of brothers when it comes to these extremists, from Tommy Robinson all the way to Tate to many 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 others, and they're all in touch with each other. You know, th there's networks out there, and they work really closely together, and they understand how to get the funding in and how to develop their messaging and all those things. So just just to be clear, you know, we're not talking about one specific group. Um, Claire, I just want to check, are you happy for us to go to questions now or? Yeah, please. Although, frankly, I'd like to sit and listen to you two talking forever. You're just really, really interesting. And I, I just I'm scribbling down notes because some of your phraseology is just so bang on, both of you, that that is how I want to be able to articulate my thoughts and feelings around these subjects. So uh, thank you so much. 
Um, I have picked up a few questions amid the really interesting uh, comments in the chat. So if I could put those, um, I think there's four areas um, to both of you to begin with, and then ask anybody who'd like to ask a question themselves to uh, use the raise hand function, then we'll be able to pick you out more easily. Uh, so there was the, the first question was around, should we actually be calling Tate an influencer? Does that validate him? Uh, I know that when we were working out what on earth we call tonight, we had our own internal debate at LWN of, well, do we call it tackling Tate? Because we want to call a spade a spade and have people know what issue we are wanting to talk about and discuss. And on the other hand, we don't want to create that, you know, validating hero worship platform because we know that people, you know, figures like him have as many counterparts to thrive on notoriety um the next question was around well how he persuade it's more a couple of comments I've picked out from the chat around the, how I would say he message boxes his acceptability to kids so in LWM we are big fans of the message box when you're running for parliamentary selection for example you want to know what you're saying about yourself you want to know what your opponents are saying about you uh, and you want to know what your opponents are saying about themselves. And what he's saying about himself is very much, you know, I'm a successful businessman. That's why you need to respect me. Uh, don't listen to all those feminists in the corner. Uh, you know, Those kind of those techniques for validating his um, his kind of reputation. So um, if you have any thoughts around that uh, also there was a question about what resources teachers need to try and tackle this in schools I know obviously Alex you've been speaking to the education ministers here uh, anything actually that is coming from the teaching community about what would be the most helpful resources for tackling it and also um, what Labour are up to in Wales on this there was a sister saying that she thinks the work being done there is um, more impressive than that which is being done um, over this side of the border that one might be slightly more for Alex than Shyster but yes. over to both of you. Alex, you want to kick off with the the one about the language? So, do, do we call yeah. Andrew Tate an influencer? What what's your take I mean, on this? I mean, he is an influencer, but I hate calling him that. Um, I always say he's one of many, so I don't like to pin him out as an individual because he is one of many. Sadly, there's many of them now per perpetuating this lifestyle and narrative online in terms of uh, just hitting below the threshold of of takedown in terms of what the content that they are saying, but it's implied and then that pushes them to other extreme sort of video content um and it's it's difficult because as you said he thrives off this notoriety he thrives off the being sort of known as the bad boy of the internet who you know people keep shouting down and um it drives traffic to his channels because the more we talk about him in the media the more people seek him out to find out what he's saying and then he gets sucked in so it's how do we how do we try and talk about him and tackle him without giving him that free publicity and media notoriety and it's it's difficult because you've got to call it out. You've got to call out misogyny and you've got to call out somebody. I think it was Lee said, do we call him an accused rapist? Yeah, it's referring to his criminal activity as well. You know, this man is um, accused and is waiting charges of the most horrendous, heinous crimes. And it's how do we get that message out there that this isn't you know, this isn't something that our young boys and girls want to be emulated and he isn't the hero that they should be worshipping here. He is a accused criminal and he belongs in prison if he's found guilty of what he's of what he's been accused of. Um, but it's yeah, it's difficult. How do we counteract that sort of narrative? Yeah. So I think one of the ways I agree with everything you said, one of the ways of counteracting it is making sure that our media use the correct language. We all know how important language is. If we know this already, but just look at the events of the past week in this country alone. Um, but I'm, I'm very uh, disturbed by this thing about the influencer. He may he is an influencer on social media, but the rest of the media don't need to call him an influencer. I think they need to call him out for what he is. Um, you know, he's a loud, proud, unapologetic misogynist. He's not exactly trying to hide that, is he? Um, but also, I think this also uh, really intersects into... Uh, other forms of oppression. So I've really know as a trained journalist, I've noticed in the last few years, people are no longer being called far right. They're being called far activists, right wing activists. It's like, if how when did a member of the far right, a leader of the far right, the likes of Tommy Robinson and others, um, how when did they start being called activists? When did that start happening? It's a very 
kind of it's, it's happened over a, yeah we're legitimizing them yeah exactly and so this language is it's really subtle the ways it's shifting and i think we have to get better at calling calling people what they are in a much more clearer way um and then that leads us on to the second question which is about messaging um so uh claire was talking about you know when we do the um lwn training you know we're given lots of excellent advice around how we message uh, produce messaging around us, our values as individual women in politics, but also the movement. Um, now, let's be clear here, Alex, the right are champions are telling their story and the far right are champions are telling their story as well. And I think the rest of us, we seem to kind of be scrambling around, kind of trying to yeah. work out, scratching our heads, trying to work out what to do. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're always more organized. And this is this is the problem, isn't it? Like you said, you know, we've we've become too split or we spend too much time sort of discussing what should we do? What should we call this? What campaign should we use? What sort of is the narrative? Whereas they are very organized and very slick and are very astute in terms of tapping into that um, need for a short three three line slogan or whatever it is that will capture the attention and imagination of whatever audience they're appealing to whether that's children whether that's young boys young men or even women in terms of how they're positioning themselves and it's we need to be more organized we need to be more astute to this and we need to get our act together because they, they've had theirs together for years and years and years and if we're going to sort of form any sort of uh counteraction against them then we need to do the same yeah, and I also think we need to get much better at telling stories in a way that relates to people. So we've got some other questions here, but just very quickly, I'm going to tell you this story in a minute, I promise, right? So I went door knocking a couple of years ago, and this very agitated man was very aggressive towards me. I, you know, I kept my distance, but we carried on talking. And then he just started, um, he said to me, are you going to stop the immigrants from coming in? I said, excuse me? I said, no, I'm not an immigration officer. I'm here to ask you about who you're going to vote for the local elections. This went on and on. He started weeping. This grown white male started weeping. I was like, okay. So I kept quiet, let him finish. Turns out that he was heartbroken because he lost his dad recently. He can't find a job. He's got three degrees, blah, 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 blah. His story was really powerful. Mm. And as a minoritized woman, he chose to talk to me and tell me and so the reason why I'm sharing this here is because I feel that often we're scared to connect with people. Now, you know, I told him straight, I said, look, listen, sir, if you have political views, I'm here to listen to you. If you have racist views, I am not interested and I'm leaving. So tell me which one of these options you want to go, go for. So he said, OK, oh, I'm sorry. He apologised to me. He said, I'm really sorry for behaving like this towards you. I should be a better person. I should be a better man. I said, yeah, you should. Now, let's get back to what you need to talk about, right? So everybody else was sort of scurrying past. All the other canvases were like, oh, God, let's keep going. Now, I'm one of those awkward people who like um, to be uncomfortable mm. and like to have uncomfortable conversations. So I think this is part of our challenge in politics is to reach out to people and to hear them. Yeah, Not I to legitimise any of their nonsense and bigotry, but to listen to them and to get them to understand that we've got to work through this together, haven't we? Yeah, we've got to get out of the bubble narrative as well that, that social media is the real world because it's not. And life at the moment for people across the country is pretty crap, let's be honest. You know, you've got rising fuel bills, rising energy, rising food prices, you know, um, a cost of living is going up, mortgages are going up, um, nobody's got any money to do anything fun. It's dark, it's cold, it's wet, it's been miserable. They've had politics thrown down their throats for the last 10 years and nothing's changed as they've seen it. At least that's what people are telling me on the doorstep. And they're angry and they're frustrated, but they're also really, really sort of disenfranchised and the apathy is real and they want someone to blame and they want someone and to be scapegoating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it's easy for this government to blame someone else, as what as which is what we're seeing right now that's happening in this chamber, in this building. And yeah. it's easy for them to deflect blame, to try and cling on to power when they've been in charge for 13 years and, and the blame lies squarely at their door. And that's the conversations we need to be having. That's the conversations all of us need to be having is, you know, where is your anger directed at? And, and it's trying to convince people who have had politics, as I've said, thrown down their throats for 10 years, that you've just got to keep going because... 
it's hard. The slog out there, as we all know, you know, all, all our sisters know when we're on the doorstep is, is getting voters to come back to us and, and getting them to trust us again. Not, not all politicians are the same, that they, you know, things can get better. It's just we need to change who's behind the door of number 10 for the right colour, not, not, you know, not yeah. the change um, that they had constantly. And it's, absolutely. Yeah, it's and we need better politics. Before. We need much better politics and we need more of the women on this screen. Uh, in uh, in councils and in Westminster and everywhere else. Okay, so there's a couple more questions uh, that I want to try and cover off. One was the one that Claire asked about in relation to schools and what kind of resources do, can we sort of try and enable schools to have. There's an excellent question here from someone. I'm not going to name you just because I'm not sure if you want to be named. But anyway, you're saying here, your 18-year-old daughter is here and wants to ask what can be done to change the algorithms and help young boys, men see more positive role models and how can you push for more funding for schools? So thank you for reiterating that question. And thank you also to your daughter for being here. Uh, great to know that you're part of this discussion. So, Alex, any any thoughts on on those two things? Yeah. So, the best people to sort of develop this is teachers themselves. They know what they're dealing with day in day out, and and teachers are taking it upon themselves. You know, I've been contacted by teachers across the country who've been creating their own resources and want to share it with other schools. And I've put been putting schools in contact with each other, and and sort of our teaching unions are sharing resources, and the, the charities are stepping up. But as, but it's very piecemeal. It's happening where certain teachers are leading that way because they know they recognize the problem it's not happening in every school these discussions aren't happening everywhere and that's what we need to change somebody asked me about what's happening in wales we have taken the brave step to sort of change the curriculum it's not been smooth sailing some you know th there's been resistance our schools minister jeremy miles has been sort of leading the charge here because he knows things needed to change um to try and tackle this problem in order to give teachers more opportunity to have that necessary training to keep up to future proof them with what's changing, you know, what's ever narrative is changing because who knows what the latest technology will be or who knows what the latest issue will be. So it gives them the freedom to be able to do that. It gives them the um, necessary expertise and the ability to call on necessary expertise who outside of their comfort zones if they need it in order to bring those people in to talk to the pupils about what's going on, whether that's somebody from Women's Aid or Hope Not Hate or, or any other organisation that they feel necessary and that they can have those open and honest conversations. You know, my best friend's a teacher and she sort of has taken it upon herself to talk to the kids in her class and it was only when she was talking to them that, you know, honest conversations came out. It was it was you know people the pupils felt like they could open up to her and it's about giving our teachers the freedom to be able to do that and to trust them as well to do the right thing yeah and also um for those of sisters here who are trustees i'm sure there's um, not trustees sorry governors, governors is what i'm trying to say school governors but also you may be trustees of education charities and you know community organizations i'd urge you also to kind of bring these issues up in these spaces yeah. and to support each other because often what happens is people feel a bit anxious or nervous about talking about these things and sometimes they're raised when too too many bad things have happened and at that point you can no longer try and sort of find a solution because really what you're trying to do is support something that's that's gone badly wrong so I really encourage us uh, in the Labour Women's Network to try and work out for those of us who are governors who are involved in schools in that capacity or charities to think through how we can support each other um Claire I know a couple of people have got their hands up um, so I'm going to pass over to you just to help facilitate that, please. No problem at all, I step Right, first of all, I saw Varlene and then Susie. So if we take you two and then we'll give uh, Shaista and Alex a chance to respond and then we'll go to Hipsa and Lucy, please. Varlene. Yeah, hi. Um my question is in regards to the school um, and, you know, education for boys and hopefully girls in school. But I was also thinking about in terms of the support for families um, alongside the support. I don't know whether that happens at the moment, just because I just I worry that, you know, it might get really lots of good support in terms of school. However, if it's not um, sort of supported by family, then, um, you know, it then becomes a little bit of a tick box because thousands are not part of that solution. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, actually, was it Lella in the comments who had shared something that her organisation is doing? With, so a, a tape toolkit for parents as well as a tape toolkit for teachers. So I will be clicking through on that later on. Susie. 
Um, yeah, thank you guys for what you've been sharing. It's really interesting. I work with vulnerable women in Poplar and victims of rape. Um, and so, yeah, I think my question is um, just some of, because I think, um, Alex, you made the point about pornography and the research around the connection between porn and rape culture and Tate and all that kind of stuff. I'm just interested to know like what... <clears throat> ultimately hopefully we're gonna have a Labour government that like what we're what we're thinking of doing because this is a problem that's gone on for a long time it's this wider problem of like the over sexualization of everything and you know and it's like half the time the school kids actually know where the problem comes from and it's like it's obviously down to us to actually you know do something about that but yeah I'm just interested to know whether we, yeah what we're thinking that we may do differently what kind of policies we may bring in to tackle that and the only other thing I was going to say is you look at the um, success of things like kick racism out of football and that whole thing of like positive role models. And I know people have mentioned that, but I think you've, you've got good footballers there like Rashford and others that are just, you know, and just like may, maybe whether we will, you know, do something in this day and age where they've had kick racism out of football, which actually has been very successful around this and using positive role models to actually say to boys, there's a good way to relate to girls and there's a positive way. Thank you. Thank you for both those questions. Alex, do you want to? I'll go yeah. To yeah. So value, value and support for families. You're right. You know, this can't end at the school day. Um, this has to fit into our culture of conversations. And I've been talking to sports groups, you know, where men are leading teams of footballers or rug rugby and um, how we can bring that chat there, whether, you know, anyone who's who's in a position where they are able to talk to young people about this issue, then it, it falls on them to sort of do more and to try and stem some of the issues that we're facing here. But I chair in Parliament the All Party Group on Perpetrators of Domestic Abuse. And one of the most stark issues that has um, frightened me since I've taken over the sort of chairing of that group is the rise in um, attacks on women in terms of mothers and grandmothers by sons and grandsons um, over the past couple of years, especially post pandemic, that sort of power control, physical abuse, financial abuse, coercive control that um, young boys are having on their mothers and grandmothers. And it's, it's, it's an issue and it's on the rise and it's something that we need to look to tackle. And one of the messages that I've been pushing in all the media interviews I've done around sort of talking about online misogyny, um, talking about the content that's out there is, what would be your message? It would be parents, please have that conversation with your children about what content they're viewing. Have it over over the dinner table. You know, have that open chat about oh, what have you what have you been watching? What you what you've been looking at? What have you been googling? What have you been watching on YouTube, on TikTok, on Snapchat? What's on there? And open up that line of conversation. And they may think, oh yeah, you know that that guy that I've been watching videos of, he's actually all right. But start those conversations about why he's not or explore some of the themes of the things that they've been watching or get them to open up to you because that's the most powerful tool you can have is if you know what content your children are watching online and then you can you, you're armed then you're forewarned is forearmed in terms of how you get to tackle that that's a big thing uh Susie and the over sexualization yet yeah, porn um so Diana Johnson Dame Diana Johnson's been leading the way on this for us in terms of um her all party group that she chairs it's just done its um landmark report they did an inquiry into looking at the impact of pornography and um, what we can do about it. And the online safety bill doesn't go far enough. And I've made that point clear at the dispatch box time and time again, in terms of it has to be age verification, not just age assurance. It cannot be the case that I can, it's more difficult for me to place a bet on the football than it is for me to watch extreme pornography. It, it's, it's ridiculous that that's the case. Um, so it needs to be, you know, it needs to have more safeguarding in place. It needs to be regulated better. It needs to be um, more difficult to access, um, especially for children. They shouldn't be able to access this content online very easily with a click of a button. It shouldn't be able to be on Twitter, but it is. Um, and it's what's Labour going to do. We've already pledged to bring in a stronger online safety bill to close the loopholes that the government have failed to address. We've said that this needs to be tackled. Um, it's something that has pervaded government after government after government, and they've said that they're going to tackle it, but they've failed to do so. But no, we've we've pledged to do it. It's in our it's in our manifesto. Yeah, and we also need to tackle it in Westminster, right, Alex? Because yeah, uh, well, yeah, because when, when the lawmakers are yeah, you know, we need to see the the behaviours we want to see in society modelled right at the top and sadly we're not seeing that are we and Absolutely. I think also um, you know this question about supporting families is critical isn't it because at the end of the day as we said earlier on it, 
we, we're, in a, we're in a society where we're not encouraged to talk about things. Yes, now certain things, you know, are, there's a little, little less pressure, only a smidgen around mental health and things like that. But it's kind of, you know, just very, um, it's very uh, random where, where there's a mental health awareness week or there's a suicide prevention week or something along those lines. But the rest of the time, you know, so I think a lot of the, a lot of the crux of the issues here are that we have to be, find ways to support people families, communities, to have these discussions. And often when people are desperate and crying out for help, there's no one there for them either. So this is part of the challenge. And as we said earlier on, there is a link between pornography and domestic violence and the murder of women and extremism and terrorism uh, and organized terrorism. There, there is a total connection here. No one can deny it. All the evidence shows that. Um, there's a couple of more hands up, um, and I'd love to get those questions in from the sisters. So, Claire, can I hand back to you, please? There's always one time where you have to press mute three or four times before it lets you unmute. I swear the algorithms are starting to hit the sisterhood zooms. Um, right. I we have um, Hifsa and Lucy have been waiting very patiently and then hopefully we will also have time for Alison and Emma afterwards. Hifsa. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, apologies, I'm actually sitting in a car um, listening to you which and it's been absolutely f fascinating. Um, as Claire said, I could sit and listen to the two of you all, all evening. Um, I've worked in um, counter extremism and radicalisation for over 12 years. And the language that I see coming out around Andrew Tate and his cronies, in all honesty, um, is no different. Yeah. I was in a college last week and um, talking, I was talking to about 40 or 50 tutors there. And at the end of the session, one of the, the tutors came up to me and said, if so, we really need you to come in and speak to our adult learners um, who are Muslim women. And I'm bringing that up because we've talked about young people, we've talked about young boys and, and, and men, but what we've missed out on is, is older women. And she went on to tell me about this group that she has of adult learners, um, vast majority are Muslim women who think Andrew Tate is absolutely fantastic. Um, and the, the tutors are saying, how on earth can we challenge what the young people are saying when actually their mums are agreeing with it? <laughs> and that is becoming a real, real issue. Um, I, I, I mean, I've seen it and I've heard it within the Muslim community because Muslim women, um, some Muslim women, I'm certainly me and Shais that don't fall into this category, who think that he is the epitome of what a good Muslim man should be. Um, and they say, they're telling their children this in the homes as well. Um, and that, that for me is a, is a real challenge. Um, and like Varlene said, you know, we need to be tackling this, not just as a young people thing or a boy thing. Um, it's actually a much, much wider issue. Sorry, it's more of a statement than a question. Yeah. No, you're right. Can I just also pick up on um, one of the other comments um, in the chat there, which um, I was reminded of because obviously Hipster uh, has had to pull over whilst driving. And I know we've also got Harriet Digby dialing in from a lay by in the A1. Uh, the places people will stop to hear a good slice of sisterhood in their week, um, who was asking about links between this kind of millennial misogyny and the sort of predecessor incel movement and also asked for any tips you might give to advise a young woman who has been undervaluing herself uh, but Lucy can we take you bring you in as well before we go back to uh, Alex and Shyster thanks very much um you you really kindly answered my question about the kind of what teachers want which is fantastic um and, and I think it was really interesting when you're saying kind of teachers are sharing resources um and so I was just thinking how do we help everybody kind of share resources um I'm doing some training next month for teachers and so I thought maybe if we can kind of start messaging each other with resources we can kind of have a pool of people working in schools who can kind of be sort uh, sort of have re be resource hubs and keep kind of sharing that information I thought that might be 
really helpful so we can kind of point people to certain directions and um and then just a personal plug that um i've just completed a toolkit for the national education union around sexism in uh, schools and um it, it looks at that more kind of holistic model and that kind of conversation and i think it's quite helpful to reduce that power of andrew tate and right. when we refer it to kind of sexism and sexual harassment and kind of reduce that sort of he's one person with that power and say no this is about whole school approach and it's about the bigger picture but yes any other ideas about resource sharing would be really welcome let's keep doing that thanks love the idea of a resource up can i just also bring in lucy naylor because we have a double lucy contribution tonight and i know that lucy naylor had also been waiting patiently so if we could just bring you in and then i'll go back to the panel and then we'll scoop up the last remaining hands yeah. um thanks claire my previous co it's been really inspiring this evening and my previous fairs summary prior to that actually tied together a lot of my thoughts because i've seen some things in the chat about plymouth based stuff um in terms of the murder of Bobby Ann and the violence against women and girls work that's been going on there, which has been a really powerful conversation. And also, again, with Plymouth, um, Luke Pollard's doing a lot of work on incel culture. Yes. And I think that that is really helpful as an ally. But I was probably most inspired by what Shyster said, because I do a lot of door knocking and it's fascinating to tackle all these sort of comments on the doorstep. But it can be really challenging partly because you're knocking on that doorstep on your own, even though you've got people next to you, but also you've got that uh, you've got that pressure to churn through the doors, you know, and make as many contacts. But actually, I find that you can change these, change the context and change people's minds so much better when you challenge people and discuss these things face to face. And what I was going to suggest, um, I know that there's lots of information on Labour's Achieve More portal about like how to door knock how to have doorstep conversations and I was wondering if Labour's Women's Network could put something on there to assist people having these sort of difficult conversations on the doorstep um, and to help people feel stronger to have those conversations and better enabled and better equipped to have them because that's where those changes are going to be needed and every single person needs to have those not just strong brilliant sisters but everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Can we go back to Shyster and Alex? Yeah. So, um, first of all, honestly, this has been such a rich um, discussion and we could talk for a lot longer, but I'm just really glad that we've started this conversation this evening. And obviously, there's a lot to follow up on. So, um, you know, Andrew Tate and, and his ilk are not a new phenom phenomena. They've been around for a very long time. And since we are all here, um, you know, we're all involved in politics, let's not forget the uh, Donald Trump phenomena, inverted commas, um, you know, and, and the mainstreaming of this misogyny and hate in our politics. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, in our society, we create these bogeymen and we kind of have this figure and they, they become almost like, um, caricatures, which is what happened with Trump, and no one was really willing to hold him to account. And I think we've got to be careful about not, uh, you know, we need to be careful, not because we're not saying that Andrew Tate is not a dangerous individual, but we can't just pin this on one figurehead. This goes way beyond that. Um, I was actually going to finish off just by saying there's a fantastic podcast on the BBC website called The Coming Storm. I don't know if anybody has heard it. It's fantastic. It's um, by the BBC's Gabriel Gatehouse, and he looks at the uh, Capitol, um, the the um, insurrection in Washington DC in 2021. And lo and behold, it goes all the way back to the incel movement. And it's connected to um, all sorts of misogynistic and, and less, less misogynistic and more unfortunate um, kind of experiences that young men in the US are having. And it sort of connects um, the dark web and all these types of uh, things that are going on and shows how it collides and got, how it, became a mainstream political phenomena. So I'd encourage us to watch that. I'd also encourage us 
to really understand, uh, Hifsa, your point is so important, okay? So I'm not trying to dismiss your point, but I also think it's important for us to understand all forms of extremism, be it the far right, be it so-called radical Islam, which is also extremism, and everything else in between. There are such parallels between them, and women throughout history have been the foot soldiers of patriarchy. And this sometimes makes women feel uncomfortable. It's a fact, and so we have to start tackling that if we are also going to tackle the misogyny uh, and the patriarchy in, in the brains and the bodies of men as well. We have to tackle it with the women too. Yeah. You're right. Hifs is right. Um, it's about that systemic culture change um, throughout everything. Burn it down and start again. And how do we get that message out there? Um, but you reminded me of something that I that I forgot to mention, which is that teachers are telling me that because they're at the end of their tether with this, they're having to deal with something literally every day. They're having to refer young boys to prevent you know, because they've they've got nothing else to do. That, that, that is the last resort that they're having to refer these children to prevent in terms of um, how much they're being radicalized by this extremism and they've got nowhere else to turn. And that's what that's the sort of the last resort. But then they don't really get told in terms of what happens after that. You know, these children just get referred to prevent and it's on to the next one, on to the next one. And it's it's petrifying that that's what they're having to do. But it is that extremism, that radicalization of young boys. And that's the only avenue that teachers have got in terms of accessing support. Um, Lucy on sharing resources, absolutely. I um, Email me after this and I'll put you in touch with the people that I've been talking to. And we can, yeah, you, somebody mentioned maybe getting it on Labour Women's Network and disseminating it that way. Happy to yeah, share that because the teachers I've been talking to want it out there as, as wide as possible. Um, how do we um, sort of girls, girls empowerment, how do we get them to value themselves and see them as more than just something that should be for men's pleasure or men's entertainment? It's, it's a big one. It's giving them value. It's sort of changing the narrative and getting into in, inspiring them to do something else and, and you know, uh, that they are worthy of more than that. And it's it's on to all of us to sort of do that. Um and I recently did a roundtable with some girls in my constituency who weren't the sort of more able and talented girls. And the school wanted me to come in and chat to them. These were girls who, who'd never been to Cardiff. You know, they've literally been in the valleys their entire life. They've never been on a bus to Cardiff. And it was about how we um, tell them that there's more out there for them if they want it and whatever that may be, you know, and it's about getting them to achieve their full potential and that the world hasn't written them off really, because that's what, how they feel, some of them, and this may be their only outlet. And I was chatting to one girl who had sent videos and footage and pictures of herself to men much, much older than her, because it gave her, she said it gave her self-worth, it gave her attention that she hadn't had before, it gave her a um, that sort of meaning, and it, and it was really, really sad and heartbreaking, and it was that nobody had sort of given her a chance, really, so it's about how we how we empower women and girls to know that they are much so much more than that. Um, and Lucy Naylor on Luke Pollard, yeah, Luke has been leading the charge in the PLP on incel culture. He's been doing some brilliant work on this. Um, I've been working with him on the online safety bill after, you know, the tragic, horrendous Kiem shooting and what we can do here to try and tackle that, and it is all leading to that uh, dark web incel culture you know we had a 15 year old boy who got in touch with us who said um, all he did was google um, why can't I get a girlfriend and then was pushed into this online world of much older men telling him that it was his right to have a girlfriend he didn't want one anyway because women were evil and women should want him and it and all, that's all he did as any sort of you know 15 year old boy would do is sort of all well, my mates have got a girlfriend why can't I get one and it's as easy as that the, they are susceptible they are craving that sort of um uh, feeling of belonging that they're not alone that they're they're not the outsider and it's it's frightening and somebody mentioned earlier I know we're short on time but somebody mentioned earlier can the algorithms change can they do something to push positive role models yes they can and we know they can do this um during the sort of uh, Francis Haugen whistleblower of Facebook and Meta uh, met with us to say during uh, the American election where Trump won uh, there was uh, the algorithms were turned off so it was prevented from being pushed disinformation around the election and around Trump that populist narrative but because the engagement actually dropped um, and the uh, monetization value of certain content and posts wasn't being shared as widely and they they lost ad revenue the decision was made at Facebook to turn it back on so they can absolutely choose to do this and and they did and it's had direct impact and we've seen it so yeah we need to we need to legislate for it because they're not going to do it of their own accord
Thank you so much. Um, we have two minutes left, but I am going to ambitiously ask if we can have the quickest of questions each from Alison and Emma, and then if you could respond and give concluding remarks um, in the same breath, please, Alex and Shyster, that would be wonderful. So Alison, over to you. Okay, I'll try and keep this really brief. I was going to raise the issue of um, empowerment of women and girls, and I think all of us as mothers, grandmothers, aunties, big sisters, friends, relatives, etc., should do everything we can to um, support the girls in our lives. Um, I hate to put too much stuff onto teachers because I was the daughter of a teacher and you know, owner as it could be. Um, but I also think that potentially with the way that the curriculum has been devalued and degraded over the last few years, um, there's been a loss of teaching of critical thinking. And so we've got children who are just taught to accept and then regurgitate as fact what they're hearing. Um, and that's girls and boys. Anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Oh, hi. Um, so I was basically just going to comment on um, the parents allowing their children open access to the internet at too young an age. And the fact that we hear no, we hear nothing against that at all. And it's not parents fault. I think it just sort of crept into life and children have been getting them younger and younger mm. and it isn't necessary I have a 14 year old and I think we went too young we waited till high school that was later than a lot of people but that you know I still think that's too young I've been following the work of somebody called Jonathan Haidt a social psychologist and he has said there's a direct correlation between a lot of mental health crises particularly in young girls and suicide and the and the advent of the internet on smartphones when they started to get smartphones I'm just wondering, like, there's no messaging out there about it that's going to help parents. I think if we had a nationwide sort of supportive message, parents would feel more confident to actually sort of control the, the internet influence that their children are getting. It's been proven that teenagers can't really cope with it. Thank you. <laughs> I have to be, be quick, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. Um, Shyster, if we go uh, to you for your last words, please. Yeah. So, you know, we've had a really important discussion uh, this evening, which I hope um, there will be some follow up work from all of us on, in relation to that. So I just want to say, I think it's also really important for us to understand that there is a lot of hope out there. There's a lot of people pushing back. Young people are very smart as well. And they, you know, they passionately believe in equality. Um, perhaps they understand it much more, especially intersectionality. They maybe don't understand it in those words, but they understand it far more than you know my generation did when I was their age. So I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. Um, at the end of the day, as adults, we need to protect them better, and we need to work with them to make sure their voices are being listened to. Um, and whatever's happening online happens offline. And I think often, because of the nature of society in the world, there's a lot of focus on what's going on online and I'm not saying there shouldn't be but I'm also saying that we need to focus on what's happening on the streets in our homes uh you know in all all the settings that we're in daily because that that is also uh something that we need to tackle and we can't we can't um focus on one without focus on focusing on the other we have to do it together yeah I agree I, I don't think you know the internet is wonderful it's not the internet that's the bad thing here you know I'm, I'm the shadow tech minister and part of my role is to sort of drive innovation look at skills for the future where we're going to get these brilliant jobs for our young people where we're going to get sort of those those opportunities and it is the internet it is that's that innovation that tech sector learning those skills in school but we also need regulation which we've had nothing of in the internet since its existence you know we're playing catch up now and that's what we're trying to do is how do we make this incredible resource a safe space for everybody to be able to harness the potential of it and um I'm petrified of what's to come in terms of the metaverse and AI and the impact of automation the impact of um uh, data harvesting and what that could do and sort of the direction of hate and, and division that's spurred online but it's 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 a wonderful tool um in order to sort of yeah reach so many people you know this, this meeting is happening at the beauty of the internet we, we've all met because of, of the internet and it's it's not necessarily internet that's the bad thing it's just we need better regulation and safeguarding protections in place for children so that they're not accessing that inappropriate content so that they are safe but also so that it's a 
fair playing ground because at the minute it's not. We are being pushed disinformation, misinformation. We are being um, actively sort of targeted by um, algorithms that are um, sending us content that we haven't searched for, that we don't want. So it's about how we regulate that and make it a fair playing field and making the online space as safe as it is offline and vice versa because they're intersect they're interchangeable now. It's one community. It's not either or. Um, and it's about, yeah, Alison, empowerment of women and girls. It's on all of us to do better. And it's on on all of us to sort of, yeah, you know, throw down the nets for the next generation and, and to make sure that we do better. Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody, for this evening. It's been really, really wonderful. I've loved it. I was really looking forward to it for weeks and, and it was everything I thought it would be and more. So thank you all for a brilliant evening. I've loved it. Oh, thank you, Alex, and thank you, Shyster. You have been everything I expected you to be. You have been rigorous and wide ranging in your examination of this issue, but also human and relatable and so enjoyable to listen to your you two in conversation. And a huge thank you to everyone who has contributed both verbally and to the rich discussion in the comments where there are heaps of really helpful suggestions, links, etc., for how we can move forward as a feminist activist challenging this issue. Um, if you would like some more um, misogyny uh, battling through your month of March, we have uh, tomorrow night, we are uh, walking anybody who's interested in studying for parliamentary selection through Labour's selection process. Myself and Nan Sloan will be taking you through what you need to do week by week. Uh, and next Tuesday, we will be welcoming uh, Labour's Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury uh, to discuss her journey into politics, but also perhaps some of the things in her intray at the moment, like uh, holding the government accountable for the uh, awful measures that Alex is about to go off and vote on with regards to refugees and channel crossings, etc. What on earth do we do with a government that just has no sense of the law? Uh, and then on the 23rd, we will be welcoming Ellie Reeves, MP, and Councillor Sharon Thompson to discuss uh, parenting and politics, and hopefully in quite a positive frame of mind that shows us that contrary to some of the kind of burnout narratives and the you-can't-have-it-all narratives that actually in comparison to quite a lot of sectors, there this is a space in which um, you can make being a carer and having constituents work. Uh, and finally, but not uh, last but not least, on the 28th of this month, we have Alison McGovern MP and Nan Sloan in conversation with Kim and Mayhill as they discuss the centenary of the election of the first three ever women MPs, including the sadly forgotten Margaret Bonfield, who went on to become the first ever woman cabinet uh, minister and privy councillor in the UK and who LWN are working with the women's PLP to try and make sure that she reclaims her rightful place in history with a portrait in the Commons and a much bigger written legacy. So you can find details of all of those at www.lwn.org.uk forward slash events. Uh, my colleague Jane has put that link in the comments if you want to copy and paste and register for any of those now yeah, it would be lovely to see you all again may I say a huge thank you to Jane and to our other colleague Kat uh, who do so much work behind the scenes to make events like tonight happen and may I say sisters go forth in sisterhood go forth in bold feminism and let us tackle the unmentionable man and all of his silly friends together with pride good night Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.